So, so far I've just been giving you a number. So far I've just been giving you a number for use as a discount rate. Do you think that's reality that the gods of finance just hand you a number to use? No, you've got to figure out what that number is. And so that's what we're going to be doing in this chapter is figuring out the appropriate rate of return given the risk of the project. Now, it could be a factory, it could be a machine, it could be a financial investment. All of those things, we're going to have to figure out what is the appropriate discount rate. So how are we going to figure that out? Well, it turns out we have these lovely laboratories for pricing risk. They are called markets. And as long as we have a stock market and a bond market where we have up-to-date information, we should be able to figure out uh, what the rate is for a given level of risk. Now, firms are typically uh, funded with a mix of debt and equity. By the way, a firm can be 100% equity. Can it be 100% debt? No, someone's got to own something, right? And so there's always going to have to be at least a part of the firm that is equity. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use the information that we get from the debt markets, from the equity markets, and we're also going to take information about the firm's capital structure, and we're going to figure out what is the firm's cost of capital. And that's going to help us nail down at least one rate for one type of project, and that is the projects that are identically risky to the overall firm. And I'll give you some examples for that. Questions so far? Okay, so let's talk about, we said we're going to look at equity and debt. So let's look at equity first. And in chapter 6, we said that there are two ways to determine equity cost. Now, a lot of people get confused and they think that equity has no cost. Because after all, does the firm have to pay dividends? No, therefore equity is free. Not true. Here's why. If you're not paying dividends, then how are people going to get a return for their investment? They're only willing to buy the equity at a discount because they're going to insist on that capital gain in order to get the return that they need for the riskiness. And so equity is not free. Don't let that work its way into your brain. So with the two ways that we have to determine equity costs, the first one is uh, CAPM. What does CAPM stand for? Yeah, capital asset pricing model. And what is SML? Security market line. The security market line. Okay, so those, and, and that's going to be your beta and risk free rate sort of thing. And then we have the dividend discount model, which I think we've also called the dividend growth model. And it basically comes back to that well, how fast are the dividends growing and what is the dividend yield? So let's talk first about the security market line. We say that the expected return on stock I is equal to the risk-free rate multiply or plus beta sub I, so that's the beta for the given stock, multiplied by, what do we call that thing there in the brackets? The market risk premium. And the market risk premium is just the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. By the way, when you read the questions, Make sure you understand whether they're giving you the market risk premium or the expected return on the market because we can't treat them the same. Okay, let's see what else we've got going on here. If we want to just look at the risk premium on the stock, we could just uh, subtract risk-free rate from both sides and it would give us the expected return on the stock minus the risk-free rate, which by definition is the risk premium on the stock. What does that do to the other side? Well, it turns out that the risk premium for the stock is just beta times the market risk premium. And so if you've got a stock that has a beta of two, the risk premium for that stock will be twice the market risk premium. Because remember, beta is all about how the stock moves compared to the market. If it's got a beta of two, it's gonna be up twice as high when the stock market's up and it's going to be down twice as much when the stock market is down. 
By the way, what's riskier, high beta or low beta? Yeah, the higher the beta, the riskier it is. And we said beta is our uh, measure of systematic risk. That's the stuff you can't get rid of. So what do we need to make this security market line equation work? Well, we need an estimate of the risk-free rate. We need an estimate of the market risk premium. And we need an estimate of the equity securities beta. By the way, we're going to learn later on that there are betas for debt. But typically, we assume those are zero. So how do we estimate the risk-free rate? Remember, we said we can't observe the risk-free rate directly. What we have to do is find something out there that is as close to risk-free as possible. In the United States, we use the three-month U.S. Treasury bill. It has, in theory, zero default risk because it's from the United States government. And also, it has very little interest or price risk. Can anyone tell me why it has very little interest or price risk? Yeah, it's only three months to maturity, right? And so those little changes in interest rate only get multiplied or magnified up to the 0.25 power. Okay, so this is the least risky thing we know. Therefore, we're going to use the yield on that three-month United States Treasury as our stand-in for the risk-free rate. Is it perfect? No. Because we know that there's a little bit of interest risk there, and you might be tempted to say, well, wait a minute, isn't there a one-month Treasury bill that would have even less price or interest risk? And the answer is yes, that's true. However, it's not very popular, and so it's not traded quite a bit. It's not as liquid as the three-month Treasury bill, and so the, we, we say the data on it's not as good, so we're going to use the three-month. Now, when you're doing a problem, uh, and you're trying to find which, which is the, of these is the risk-free rate, whatever Treasury bill is given, that's going to be your risk-free rate. And so one of the things you're going to have to do when you're looking at problems, am I going to say uh, expected return on the market is? I may give you something else, and you have to figure out that that thing stands in for the expected return on the market. In this example, it's a three-month Treasury bill that stands in for the risk-free rate. Questions so far? Okay. Now we're going to talk about estimating the market risk premium. Can we observe the market portfolio directly? No, we can't. <coughs> Here's the reason. Remember that the market portfolio is every risky asset known to man held in proportion to its importance in the world economy. We can't observe that. So what do we do? Well, we have to find another stand-in. And in the United States, we typically use the S&P 500 as our stand-in. And so if I give you the expected return on the S&P 500, you should say, aha, that's going to be my stand-in for the expected return on the market. Now, if I ask you what's the expected return on the S&P 500, uh, you could probably, you, well, how would you find that? What would you do? Oh, very good. He says it's in the book. Um, but what do you have to specify when you say the expected return? First of all, we're going to be using historical data, right? Now, the question is this. If I just looked at the most recent full year that we've got, 2023, what would I say the expected return on the market was? You guys don't know, but it was a damn good year, right? My, my stuff was up like 23, 24%. Poof, right? Pretty sweet. Can I expect that every year? Absolutely not. And so I've got this freshest estimate uh, of 24% or 23%, but uh, statistics, they tell us that we want a larger sample size. So I've got data all the way back to 1926. Should I go that far back? No, and here's why. Think about the United States economy. If you go back to 1926, our primary industry in, and I, I use the word industry, our primary business in this country was what? Agriculture. Yeah, it was agriculture. You know, I come from a long line of farmers, and 1926, my grandfather, uh, they're, they're raising cattle, they're growing wheat, this sort of stuff. Now, 
That's one particular type of economy. Now World War II comes along. What, has, what happens during World War II to our economy? Mechanization. Yeah, mechanization. So we're going to, first of all, we're going to put machines on the farm because what's happening to the laborer on the farm? We're going off to fight, right? And so then, but we also have the problems with uh, laborers being gone from the factories. So who steps in? Ladies, who steps in? Women. Women, right? That's where we get Rosie the Riveter. Okay, now here's the, the deal. During that time frame of World War II, we switched from being an agricultural nation to being an industrial nation. Now we always had industry and we always had agriculture and we'll always have both, but there was a big flop at that time. Okay, after World War II, the United States is one of the few countries on the planet that hasn't had its industrial base bombed out or burnt out, right? And so for the next couple of decades, we are a manufacturing powerhouse. But then uh, we start to have some competition from actually some people that we helped rebuild after the war. Japan and Germany, right? They start to give us some competition. Eventually China comes along. United States, we still manufacture things, but is that our primary thing anymore? No, in the 80s, we went to something called a service economy, and now we're on to something called a knowledge or information economy. So what am, what's my point in all that? As the economy changes, do you think that the expected return on the market portfolio would also change? Absolutely it would. And so it doesn't make any sense to go all the way back to 1926. Uh, so we know we want to be more recent than that. Uh, but then the question becomes, well, is five years enough? Is 10 years enough? Is 20 years enough? And it really comes down to a judgment call. The, the best case scenario is where you do the five year and the 10 year and they come out to be pretty close together and you say, woohoo, right? I'm just gonna go with the 10 year then. Okay, now, by the way, when I'm figuring the market risk premium, if I'm going back 10 years for my S&P 500, how far back do I need to go for my uh, three-month treasury bill yield? The same amount of time, right? We've got to match those up. Now let's talk about estimating beta. If you think back to chapter, what, six, um, did I actually go through the estimate, the linear regression thing here in class? Okay, so there's a video where you can see how to do that with, with linear regression. And that is how, typically, how we would do it is through linear regression. The problem is that just like uh, the S&P 500 and the risk-free rate, the betas tend to vary over time. And so uh, we, we are, we're at this problem where we're going to either estimate the most recent period for beta to try to get the freshest assessment of what beta is. But the problem is that we have a smaller sample size. Or we can go over a longer period of time and try to get a larger sample size, but we risk losing the freshness of the estimate. So let's give an example here of Microsoft. Microsoft, by the way, Microsoft, I think they went public in, what, 1984. And so the, the oldest year we see here is 93. And what we've got going on in each of these pictures is, first of all, a set of data points. Those are the black dots. And then we have the blue line. The blue line represents the line that was arrived at through linear regression. And the question is then, how well does the line fit the data? So that's something we're going to have to ask in each of these pictures. In the first one, 93 to 97, uh, Microsoft's a fairly risky thing. It's a fairly new company, and the things that it's doing are cutting edge. In fact, I remember saying 1993, it's probably the first time I saw Windows, and that was some re revolutionary stuff. But it's still risky because we don't know. By the way, there used to be more than one operating system. Oh, yeah. We used to have, in fact, when I started my job in 1994, I did not have Windows on my computer. Okay, so 
What do we got going on? 93 to 97, it looks like our beta is 1.28. Is that safer or riskier than the overall market? Riskier. Riskier, how do we know? Uh, it's above one. Yeah, it's above one, right? Okay, now the, the next question we need to ask is, how well does the line fit the data? Would you say that line is a perfect fit for the data? No. In fact, what we would do is look at R squared for this. And my guess is that R squared is going to be somewhere around 0 0.4, 0 0.5. It's really not a perfect fit. The next thing I want to point out is the impact of outliers. Because when we calculate, when we do linear regression, we are looking at the squares of the difference between the data point and the line that we're calculating, and we're trying to minimize that. When you've got stuff like those points, those two points that are up there really high, those are called outliers, and they will actually have quite a bit of impact on what the final equation for the line is. In fact, if we took out that top uh, dot, we might be down to, say, a beta of 1.10. <coughs> and so you have to watch out for the impact of outliers. These are just all the things that you want to look at when you're trying to figure out if you can trust an estimate. Okay, now, 1997, now we're on to 98 to 2002. For those of you who uh, were alive, you'll remember this as the dot-com boom and bust. And during that time, anything computer-related was way up when times were good and was way down when times were bad. And Microsoft got swept up in that. And we see the beta during that time was 1.75. The firm was actually riskier. Now, ask yourself about the, the line. Does this line seem to be a better fit for the data? It actually does. The, the, uh, the slope, for sure, looks a whole lot better. Now, we've still got some uh, dispersion there about the mean or around the line, but it's, it's, it's better. Now, moving on to 2003 to 2007. Now, the beta is dropping below 1, and it stays there throughout the entirety of this chart. What happened? By the way, is Microsoft now safer or riskier than the market? It's safer, right? Because it's less than one on beta. Let's ask ourselves why that is. By the time you guys get to be conscious and realizing what's going on, what's on every, nearly every damn machine in the country? Microsoft Windows. Windows. And, uh, oh, and by the way, let me take you back in time. When I was in uh, undergraduate school, we had the following word processors. WordPerfect, mm -hmm. Volkswriter, and like two or three others. So there had yet to be this kind of settling out. What do we all use now? Word. Word, Word right? And we had many different spreadsheets. There was Quattro Pro and some others, but what do we use now? Excel. Excel. So basically, Microsoft went from being this cutting edge competing tech company to basically acting like a utility, right? If you're gonna get gas in Springfield, where do you get it from? City Utilities. If you're going to get uh, an operating system for your computer, where do you get it from? Microsoft. If you're going to get a, what they call a productivity suite, that's what Office is, who do you get it from? Microsoft, right? And so it makes sense that it's less risky now than it used to be. Okay, now, what I want to point out to you about this uh, 2003 to 2007 is the fit of the data. How many of you know what a shotgun is? I'm going to guess that Mr. Nylon knows what a shotgun is. Mr. Nylon, what's the difference between a shotgun and a rifle? The spread. The spread. How many bullets does a rifle shoot at one time? One. How many bullets does a shotgun, let's go with double up buckshot. It's like 69. Just nine. For a double up buckshot, it's nine 34 caliber balls, right? Now, when I shoot a rifle, how many holes show up in the target? One. When I shoot a shotgun, how many holes show up in the target? Nine. Yeah, possibly nine, right, if the spread's good. Now, I'm here to tell you that 2003 to 2007, to me, looks more like the spread on a shotgun blast than any sort of uh, mechanism that is producing a reliable outcome, right? And so I could actually take a shotgun out, 
this looks more like uh, number six, like rabbit shot or something like that. Go out, take a shotgun, shoot that, and then I could do a linear regression with that shotgun blast and pro probably come up with uh, as good a fit as I've got right here. Moving on to 2008-2012, uh, does how does the line look there? Does it seem like a better fit? It really, it really kind of does. Okay, now, why do I go into the whole shotgun discussion, the discussion of outliers and all that? It's because usually when students come up with a number, if they calculate this beta, then what do they assume about that number? They assume that it's 100% correct and infallible, right? It's not. It's not. There's measurement error involved in that. There's, there's, the line doesn't fit perfectly. And so when you are using these numbers, and eventually we're going to get to where we're doing net present value using numbers that we've arrived at here, if the net present value is barely positive, even though the rule says to accept it, maybe let's be a little bit humble and say, uh, we don't know for sure, right? Should I really invest $5 billion on this, this number that I've got? And we'll get more into that in chapter eight. Any questions? Okay, now the textbook makes this argument, or at least it used to, and the, the test, textbook said this. If you can find other people doing precisely the same thing that you're doing, you can have your cake and eat it too. This is an American expression, have your cake and eat it too. It's like the best of both worlds. So here's what I could do. I could go out and find all these firms that are doing exactly the same thing that I'm doing, and instead of finding, let's say there are five of them, instead of finding five years of my own beta, I find one year of these five firms, and I average that, and it gives me both the fresh estimate and the larger sample size. Problem solved. And so the example that's given is for the software industry. If we are planning, let's say we're going to start a software company and uh, we want to know what estimate of beta we should use. Well, they said, well, we'll just go out here and grab a bunch of betas from different software companies and then we'll just take the average of that. Let's talk about why that's not necessarily smart. First of all, on the top of our list, Microsoft and over the, the time frame that they look, the beta is 1.17. Microsoft, is it a pure play software company? No, what else do they make? They were probably making phones when that data was created. They were making phones. What else? I'm going to ask Canada. Canada, do you have an Xbox? I do. You do! Who makes the Xbox? Microsoft. Microsoft. Would you consider the Xbox to be software? No, no it's very definitely hardware, right? Can we use Microsoft as a pure play software company? Absolutely not. Okay, now, moving on to Apple. Apple's got a beta of 0.93. Is Apple a software company? Apple makes software, iOS and the Mac operating system, but what else do they make? I'll give you a hint. I'm recording this lecture on one piece of what they make, right? Yeah, the phones, the iPads, the Macs, those are hardware. Can we use Apple as a pure software company? Absolutely not, so scratch it off the list. Next we have Automatic Data Processing, or um, ADP. How many of you get a paycheck stub or a check and it says somewhere on it ADP? Have you ever seen that? If you work for a small to medium sized employer, there's a good chance that your check's gonna say ADP down in the corner. Here's what ADP does. They have created a web portal where employers can enter in information about their employees, like hourly rate, monthly rate, that sort of stuff. Then every, so the, the employer enters all that stuff, and then whenever it's time to do the payroll, that all happens via ADP, and then they have access to the checking account they make deposits, uh, automatic deposits, on behalf of the employer, or they cut checks and send them out. Either way, they send out these uh, FedEx boxes, and they're either full of stubs or they're full of checks. Last company I worked for 
we strangely got paid every Friday, whether you were sal salaried, hourly, whatever. It was it was every Friday, and we knew the uh, ADP FedEx box was going to be coming in. It came in in the afternoon FedEx, not the morning. And what do you think happened? People are waiting for the, the guy to come with with the checks, right? Okay. This actually happened to me when I was a new supervisor. It was my first week on the job. It was payday for my people. And my uh, right-hand man, Carl, he came up to me. I was talking to the other supervisors. And my right-hand man, Carl, says, hey, the checks are in. You mind if I hand them out? And I said, yeah, go ahead. And Carl takes off with the checks to hand them out. And the other supervisors are standing there with their mouths hanging open. And I said, what did I do wrong? By the way, you're going to learn to say, what did I do wrong a lot when you become a new supervisor? And they're going to say, you always hand out the checks yourself. Why do you think they would have thought that they, I should always hand out the checks myself? People like them more when they're getting their money from you. <laughs> they, they either like me more or they fear me more, right? Everything good in this life comes to you via my hand. Right? What does that also mean? Whoop! Right? I could take that away. Uh, when I was in doctoral school, the neighbors said, neighbors, boys, the college kids, they said, hey, we're getting a puppy. I'm like, great, I love puppies. What are you getting? They said, we're getting a pit bull. Oh, hell. Okay. Every day after that, when I would come home, I had a box of dog treats. And I would go out in the backyard and over the fence, and I'd say, killer! And Killer would come to the fence, and I would feed Killer a treat. Why do you think I did that? Same reason you hand out the checks, right? That's powerful. Okay. Long story short, is automatic data processing a software company? No, they're more like a business services company, so scratch them off the list. Then we have Oracle. What does Oracle do? It's like software hosting. So they, they've got databases. But they, they've got a, a mix of things that they do. And uh, I don't know if they still make them or not, but they used to make uh, terminals for Sun Microsystems because they bought Sun Microsystems. That's hardware. And so I would say that Oracle is probably not a good one either. I couldn't tell you about computer sciences. Let's skip on to CA Computer Associates. Uh, they basically maintain old software that they didn't write. Uh, so the stuff that, the old green screen stuff that is long since dead, that they support that stuff. So I'm going to call them more like a business services. Then we've got Fiserv. Fiserv actually makes software for banks, kind of like Jack Henry, which uh, I don't know if you guys know about Jack Henry, local business here, very successful. Um, Fiserv makes that software. And so at first you might think, well, wait a minute, that's good. That's a software company. But they also process credit card transactions. So we're going to have to throw them off the list. Then we get down to Accenture. Accenture doesn't write the software. They help you install other people's software and mold it to your business. So we're going to strike them off the list. Then we're on to Symantec. What does Symantec do? What kind of software? Okay, what about Norton? Norton Antivirus? Yeah. Maybe Norton Antivirus. Now, they may be a pure play software company, but does the software that they make, is it representative of the kind of risk for all software? No. If you can only afford to update one software package, what would it be? I've got Microsoft Office on one of my machines that's from 2010. And you know what? It still works fine. What do you think about antivirus from 2010? Not worth a damn, right? So if you're only going to update one, that's the one you do. That's why the beta is so low on that, right? Does that make sense? And then finally, Paychex Inc. What do you figure they do? Same thing as ADP, right? What are we saying here? You really can't do what they're saying that we should be able to do. And so it's a nice idea. And there's nothing so ugly as a beautiful theory killed by ugly facts, right? And that's what's going on here. Now let's talk about business cyclicality. The, here, so here's the business cycle. The economy grows and then the economy shrinks. And this is, it's the business cycle. And it happens over and over and over again. And it happens in all mature economies. So for the longest time I was teaching China EMBA. 
And uh, all of these people had only been in business between, say, 1980s and uh, the current day, which back then was in the mid-2010s. And they would say, but the economy never shrinks. It only grows. And I said, just wait, right? Just wait. What's going on in China's economy right now? They're starting to do similar stuff to us, right? They're having ups and downs just like we do. By the way, their reported numbers are way too high. So they're probably actually in a recession now. Okay, now, what does the cyclicality, cyclicality of the business have to do with this economic cycle? Well, if when the economy is on an upswing, your uh, sales go up, we say you are cyclical or pro-cyclical. If your sales go up when the economy's up, we say you are cyclical or pro-cyclical. If your business is up when the economy goes down, we say you are counter-cyclical. If, if your sales go up when the economy goes down, we say you are counter-cyclical. Okay, now let's think about how the cyclicality is going to make its way into our beta. We have the economy here, and the economy is driving both the sales of the firm and the overall market. If the business is pro-cyclical, the sales of the business will be up at the same time as the overall market. And if it's counter-cyclical, uh, the stock or the sales of the business will be up when the stock market is down because the economy is driving both of those things. The economy being down is driving both those things. Now, a lot of people then get the idea that, well, wait a minute, any kind of up and down in the uh, sales of a firm would be, cycl would be uh, cyclicality, and that's just not true. So we can have volatility that is not cyclicality. I'll give you an example. Let's think about movie studios. Movie studios. So what drives movie studio ticket sales more? Would it be uh, the <coughs> economic cycle, or would it be the quality of the movies that they're releasing? Yeah, it's the quality of the movies they're releasing. And so you could have uh, something amazing, and I haven't been to a movie in years, but you could have something amazing, let's say that it was actually a decent Star Wars movie for a change. You could have huge ticket sales, and then the next, the very next month, that same studio could come out with Paul Blart, Mall Cop 7, right? What a stinker. Where do they keep getting the funding for these sequels? Anyway, my point to you is this that the revenues of that movie theater are going to be up and down, but that's not cyclicality. Man, and I can prove it to you. If I can diversify it away, it's not business cyclicality. What if I bought the stock in all the movie studios? <coughs> Do you think that they're all going to have stinkers at the same time? No. Do you think they're all going to have hits at the same time? No. So I can diversify away a lot of that risk just by holding all of the movie studio stocks. Okay, so we shouldn't be concerned about just pure volatility. We should only be concerned about cyclicality unless we are the owner of the business and it is where we have all of our wealth invested. At that point, you have to become very concerned about the volatility because, after all, you're not diversified, right? You can't get away from that. I just want to make sure that you're using the term volatility interchangeably with variability. Volatility and variability, absolutely. Okay. Yep. And so we say that standard deviation is a, maintain, is, a, is a measure of volatility. We also say it's a measure of variability, even though it's not variance, right? Uh, so absolutely, he's absolutely right. Questions? Okay. Now let's talk about operating leverage and beta. In fact, I'm gonna draw a picture up here. We're going to try to do some causality. And the picture that I'm going to draw here is for a positive beta stock, but we could make the same arguments for a negative beta stock. So we're going to start out with the economy being up. And that's going to lead to the return on the market going up. 
or let's just say the market going up. So the level of the S&P 500 is rising because the economy is doing better. Now, um, on the top we're going to talk about the firm. And the first thing we're going to do is see that business cyclicality impacts the sales. And so if we have a firm that is cyclical or pro-cyclical, when the economy is up, the sales will be up at that firm. So that's the first step to see how uh, business cyclicality is going to lead to beta. Now the next thing that we're going to see is how does that change in sales impact my level of profit at the firm? And the lens, or the, the thing that's the mechanism here is going to be called operating leverage, which we're just about to talk about. In fact, operating leverage we define as the change in profitability divided by the change in sales. The change in profitability divided by the change in sales. And here we're using uh, EBIT. What does EBIT stand for? Very good, earnings before interest and taxes. Okay, now you will see it other ways. You could also discuss operating leverage in terms of net income. You could discuss it in terms of operating cash flow, so don't let that freak you out. Operating leverage. The lowest operating leverage can ever be is one. Let me say that again. The lowest operating leverage can ever be is one. And what's really making up this, this operating leverage? It has to do with fixed costs. The more fixed costs your firm have, has, the higher the operating leverage. So let's discuss why that's the case. We're going to talk about two firms that are doing fundamentally the same thing. Honda and General Motors. Honda is, uh, and they're, they're both located in the Midwest, and they both make cars, and they are both in a business that goes up with the economy when they go up, when the economy goes up, their sales do. Okay, now let's talk about the differences in the operating leverage between these two firms. If you picture in your head a Japanese car factory, do you see more robots or people? Yeah, you picture in your mind robots, and that might be true in Japan. But when Honda came to the U.S., they found something that they didn't necessarily have in Japan, and that is cheap, plentiful labor. And so I was shocked when I toured a Honda plant. This is like 99, 2000, about that time. And they're making the Honda Civic, and they're coming down the line, and it was just like a swarm of humanity working on these cars. And it just floored me that they had so much in term they had so much in terms of variable cost labor and so little in terms of fixed cost robots okay now if you go to a general motors plant let's say lordstown ohio back in the day that's where uh, they're making some crabby electric pickup trucks now uh, if you go to lordstown or if you went back then to lordstown ohio what would you be more likely to see robots or people Actually, it's the opposite. It's robots. It's robots. And here's why. What makes it uh, economically sane to invest in automation? Unions. Very good. Unions. Honda's not unionized. General Motors is unionized. As a result, what does that mean for their labor costs? Yeah, their labor costs are higher, right? Does that make sense? Okay, now. If the labor costs are higher, it's a whole lot easier for me to justify buying a robot. Okay, so now we've got Honda with a lot of variable costs and low fixed costs, and we've got General Motors with a lot of fixed costs and low variable costs. Both of them are currently working a two-shift operation. If you're not familiar with manufacturing, typically, uh, 
we design factories to run on two shifts and that gives you the third to do maintenance and things like that. During really bad times, what do you think happens to the number of shifts that we have? We drop down to one shift, right? When what do we do with those people? Yeah, we, we, we call it sending them home. It sounds nicer. Right? Yeah, sorry boys, we're gonna have to send you home. Okay, so if we look at both Honda and General Motors, Honda's got about 5,000 people per shift. So during a two-shift operation, they've got 10,000 employees. General Motors, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm being exceedingly exaggerating here, but if uh, we say, well, General Motors is mostly robots, they really only need like 12 people per shift to keep the robots running, right? And so when business is, let's say when business is up, Honda has to add a third shift. How many people do they have to hire? 5,000. How many people does General Motors have to hire to add a third shift? 12. Now, what happens to the increase in General Motors' profitability versus that of Honda? They're only, their, their fixed costs are staying the same. Their variable costs go, by, go up by very, very little. They're still selling the product for the same price, so their profitability goes way up. How about for Honda? It doesn't go up as much because they're having to pay 5,000 more people. Does that make sense? Okay, now, so far it sounds like high operating leverage is a big old unmitigated blessing, right? Because all it means when, when sales go up, my profits go up even more. But what's the downside? Any ideas? What kind of yeah, when the economy's doing bad. Uh, and I remember, I had a 10-year-old Nissan Sentra when uh, the financial crisis hit. It was a piece of crap, smelled like farts and rattled like a tin can with nails in it, right? But, do you think I held on to it? Yeah, I held on to it, I just drove around with the windows down, right? Okay, now, the same thing happens in the overall economy when the economy is good, people buy cars, when it's not, they're not buying so many cars. And so we see that uh, Honda goes down to one shift and so does General Motors. At Honda, what happens? They get to send home 5,000 people. What happens to their variable costs? Right, way down. Their overall costs go down because their variable costs go down. What about General Motors? They get to lay off 12 people. How much do their costs go down? Tiny amount. Okay, so the more fixed costs you have, the higher your operating leverage, and the greater the increase in your profit for the same level of increase in sales. So if I said we've got an operating leverage of three and sales go up 10%, then the profits of the firm would be up 30%. Now, I said earlier that the operating leverage is the lowest it will ever be is one. And that will be for a firm with no fixed costs whatsoever. A firm with no fixed costs whatsoever. I used to watch this show called How It's Made. You guys ever see How It's Made? I love that show. Uh, it's Canadian, right? Okay. It's, uh, and uh, so Brooks Moore was the ultimate narrator. And he would talk about, and one of the things that he had was a luxury Swiss watch band manufacturer. Do you remember this one? Yeah! And I'm expecting a freaky factory, right? But it's a dude at his kitchen table. And what does he have? He's got like a wood block and he's got some tools and some scissors and stuff like that. His fixed costs were... By the way, do you think he had a kitchen table anyway? Yes, he did. That's where they ate, right? Uh, so his fixed costs are like minuscule. Now, his wife walks in and says, I need 10% 10 per, 10 more money to run the house on. How is he going to make 10% more money? He has to sell 10% more watch bands. Do you see how for a place with no uh, fixed costs whatsoever, that the profit is gonna go directly with the sales. It's only once we start throwing the fixed costs in there that we start to have operating leverages greater than one. And the greater proportion of your expenses that are fixed, 
the greater your operating leverage is going to be. That's the first time anyone had actually ever saw that episode. And now people will know that I'm not totally full of crap, right? You actually can. I the nostalgia button, but I never realized that I had. Oh my goodness, I, I love that show. Okay, back to the story. Um, now, we say that operating at leverage magnifies business cyclicality. Why do we say that? Well, remember that this business cyclicality for both uh, GM and Honda is the same, right? And so when the economy's up, their sales are up about the same level. But GM's profit is up more because of this magnifying effect that operating leverage has on business cyclicality. Questions? Okay. Oh, by the way, if you've got high operating leverage and high cyclicality, that's going to be higher beta. Right? And so you're putting those things together, but we're not quite there yet to talk about per perfectly beta because everything so far here is based on the underlying assets of the firm. So it's the business that we're in and how we're set up to handle that business. So that's the risk of the underlying assets of the firm. And in fact, we'll talk later about something called the beta of the assets. The beta of the assets is totally dependent on business cyclicality and operating leverage. But there's one more thing that we need to talk about in a firm, and that is how are we financing this thing? How are we financing this thing? So, the same level of profit can produce different impacts on share price based on the capital structure of the firm. If the firm is majorly funded with debt, that's a fixed cost form of financing. And just like your fixed costs make your operating leverage high, fixed cost financing makes your financial leverage high. We say debt is a fixed cost form of financing. And so we are paying the same amount every month for those bonds, regardless of whether our sales are up or down, right? And so that means that the value of that remaining equity is a much larger swing. It's going to be the movements in the share price are going to be magnified once again by this financial leverage. And we can think back to the equity multiplier of the firm. Do you remember the equity multiplier is total assets over total equity? What's the lowest the equity multiplier can ever be? One, if the firm is entirely uh, basically financed with equity, then we know the equity multiplier is going to be one. And as we put more and more leverage in there, that equity multiplier starts to rise. And then the return on equity is equal to the ROA times the equity multiplier. Remember, we, so everything that we've been talking about over here is we're living in the ROA world, right? We're only talking about the assets. But now once we start to talk about the financing, then we get into this whole equity multiplier thing. And so financial leverage, uh, once again, magnifies this impact. Now, finally, we can see the relation between the market and the share price. It's all stirred by the movement in the economy, the business cycle. And that's going to make it, if the economy's going up, the market's going up. And we went through all this, and then we see the share price is going up. But if we look between these two, how are they related? The answer is the beta of the equity. The beta of the equity, or you could say the beta of the stock. That's how they're related. Now, am I going to expect you to draw a picture like this on the exam? No. And I'm going to expect you, by the way, I couldn't, right? It's a multiple choice exam, you can't do that. Um, 
why, why do I walk through all this with you? I want you to understand where beta is coming from. It's not just some magical thing. It's, it's actually being created by real stuff. The business cycle is real. Business cyclicality is real. Fixed cost versus uh, uh, variable cost, that's real. Um, the proportion of your capital structure that's equity versus debt, that's real stuff too. It's all going into the determination of beta. Questions? Of course, we've got to do everything as an equation here. And we are going to, we're going to say that we can actually calculate what is the beta of the underlying assets if we know uh, three things. One, the capital structure of the firm. Number two, the beta of the equity. And number three, the beta of the debt. Now, I've already told you how we can go out there and observe the beta of the equity by doing linear regression, right? And we could do something similar with the debt. We'll just use the debt prices instead of equity prices. Uh, we know what the capital structure is. By the way, whenever I do capital structure calculations, I always use the market value, never the book value. Let me say that again. Whenever I do uh, capital structure type weights like this, I'm always using the market value, not the book value. Market value and book value for debt may be similar, but they are very different for equity, always. Okay, now, uh, let's see. I think that's all I want to say for this. And by the way, do you think this formula should be on your rec sheet? Yeah, this formula should be on your rec sheet. Now, sometimes we can make an assumption if you are not told otherwise, you can assume the beta of the debt is zero. If you are not told otherwise, you can assume the beta of the debt is zero. Now, if I tell you the beta of the debt is 0.1, can you assume the beta of the debt is zero? No, because I told you otherwise, right? And if I tell you a beta of the debt, you darn well better be using this formula here because it has beta of the debt in it. But if it's not given, we can make the assumption that the beta of the debt is zero and an entire term drops out. And let me tell you why it might be okay to assume the beta of the debt is zero. Let's think about stock versus bonds. When the stock, when the market's doing really well, let's say that your stock's way up and your business is going great, you've got lots of money, you're you got a higher stock price, you're paying up bigger dividends, but then when the bad times come, what happens? Right? It goes down. Now, let's compare that to the bonds. Let's think about the cash flows for bonds. Um, here we are at time zero. At six months, I owe a coupon. Times are kind of rough, but I pay the coupon, right? Now, here we are six months later, things are okay. What do I do? I pay the coupon. The same amount, right? And then I get over here and things are going really good. What do I do? I pay the coupon, right? You see that the cash flows of bonds are much less susceptible to the business cycle than the cash flows of stocks. And so we say, for the most part, unless the firm goes bankrupt, right, unless the firm defaults, that the beta of debt, we can think of it as basically zero. Okay, when we do that, it allows us to drop that second term out, which allows us to do something pretty cool. And that is to rearrange this equation to find the beta of the equity in terms of the beta of the assets. So after that second term drops out, we're left with that top line, beta of the asset, is equal to, and by the way, here's how I would interpret that first parentheses. That's the portion of the capital structure that gets financed with equity, right? Because the whole firm's assets are D plus E. And so what we've got there is total equity divided by total assets multiplied by the beta of the equity. Well, if I just solve that thing for beta of the equity, I end up with the uh, total assets, basically, divided by total equity. And we mentioned a little earlier that total assets divided by total equity is just your equity multiplier. And so what we're saying here is that you can find the beta of the equity of any firm 
assuming that we don't have a beta for the debt, all we have to do is take the beta of the assets and multiply them by the equity multiplier. It's exactly the same idea. Just like ROE is equal to ROA times the equity multiplier, the beta of the equity is equal to the beta of the assets times the equity multiplier. When beta of debt equals zero. Once again, if beta of debt is not zero, you need to plug it in and use this other equation and solve. So let's talk about what happens here. The beta of the equity, if total assets is equal to total equity, then what is equity multiplier? Total assets over total equity. It's got to be one, right? So for a firm uh, with, no, with, uh, with no leverage, the beta of the equity is exactly equal to the beta of the assets. And that makes perfect sense because that's the only source of risk. There's no financial risk involved. But as we add more and more leverage to our capital structure, this beta of the equity climbs away from the beta of the assets in the same way that ROE climbs away from ROA as we add more and more leverage to the capital structure. Does that make sense? So let's talk about how to come up with a really risky company. A really high uh, risk stock. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out and find a business that is extraordinarily business cyclical. In other words, it's really pro-cyclical. So when the economy is up, the sales are going to be up a lot. Let's talk about luxury automobiles, right? They would have high business cyclicality. And then uh, let's go to their uh, factory. And how are we going to set up their factory? We're going to use as much automation as we possibly can, right, to get this highest possible operating leverage. I would love to be able to run this place lights out. What does lights out mean? Yeah, there's no people, right? You don't have to have lights if you don't have people. I don't know if you guys knew that, but that's the reason we have lights in factories. It's not for the robots, right? They don't care. So I got my mom a robot vacuum for Christmas. She says, do I need to leave the lights on for him? I said, no. And then she said, I don't want him to work on Sunday. And I said, Mom, he doesn't have a soul, right? <laughs> Let him work. Okay, now, uh, so then, we, so we've got high business account, we've got high operating leverage, and how am I going to finance all that? With as much debt as I possibly can, right? And so the firm with the highest beta for their stock is going to have high business cyclicality, high operating leverage, and high financial leverage. Questions? Why would you go that route? Oh, I, I, I wouldn't. You know, with that, you, you, why do you want to raise your bed? You, know, you, you, you wouldn't. Actually, what you want to do is, uh, and, and it's not a matter of raising or lowering beta. What's the goal of financial management? Maximize shareholder wealth, right? And so what am I going to do? I'm going to choose the business lines. I'm going to set up to uh, produce them. And I'm going to put my financial leverage all with thinking about in terms of maximizing shareholder wealth. If it comes out to be a beta of 0.75, fine. If it comes out to be a beta of 2.5, Fine. It does maximize it, but it also increases that risk because of that. Yeah, but what does that mean for the return that my investors are going to be getting? Higher. Yeah, right? So I'm, I never think that, and, and I only gave you this for an example, right, of what would be the absolute worst case. But I don't care what the beta is going to be, right? I'm going to build my business to maximize shareholder wealth, and whatever the beta is, the beta is. My shareholders will be fairly rewarded for the risk that they're taking, right? And I'll be at the same time uh, working to maxi maximize their wealth. Questions? Whew, boy, that was a long way to get there through uh, the capital asset pricing model and security market line. We gave you a lot more information than we did in chapter six. Now we're gonna move on to the dividend discount model. And hopefully you guys remember this, it hasn't been that long ago. We said that the required return on the stock was equal to, and we said it had two components. What is What do we call D1 over P0? What kind of yield? 
dividend. Yeah, it's a dividend yield. And so what's the other one? It's got to be the capital gain yield, right? And we said for, for uh, stocks with constantly growing dividends, the dividend grows at the same rate as the price. And that growth rate in the price of the stock is the capital gains yield. Okay. And we said that we could either get G one of two ways. We said we could get it through historical averages of our dividend uh, growth over time, or we could take uh, the retention ratio times the return on equity. So which way are you going to do it on an exam? You're going to look at the information that I give you, and you're going to figure out. If I give you that the dividends were $1, $1.10 and $1.21, you're going to be using the um, historical average, right? And that's a 10% increase each year, and so it's an average of 10%. But if I give you, let's say that I give you uh, the net income, the total equity, and the dividend payout ratio, which way are you going to go? You've got to go with the second method there, right? And by the way, if I give you the dividend payout ratio, is that the same as B? No, it's one minus, right? It's one minus. And so whatever that dividend payout ratio, I'd have to subtract it from one in order to get B. Now, there's only one drawback to this thing, and that is it does not work for firms without constant dividend growth. It doesn't work for firms without constant dividend growth. And if you go out there and look, chances are that you're going to see that there aren't any firms that actually have constant dividend growth. But we do know that dividends are sticky, and uh, as a result, something interesting happens. So the line that I'm going to draw here represents the level of dividend payment over time. What we see is that firms tend to stay with a level of dividends for a while until they are sure that the new cash flows that they've developed are going to be sufficient to raise, to pay a sustained raised dividend. And so then they'll raise the dividend and then they stick at that level for a while longer. And then they raise the dividend and they stick at that, while, that for a while longer. And it just goes on like that. Now, let's ask why that is. And the answer is there is an asymmetric response between dividend increases and dividend decreases. You might think that if I increase the dividend a little bit or, or decrease it a little bit, I, it would have the same impact on price up or down. But that's not right. The market punishes the living snot out of you for cutting your dividend. And so as a result, managers, they're not stupid, right? They're like, you know, I'm going to hold off on raising this dividend because I don't want to have to cut it. Because I know if I raise it, I'm only going to get a 1% bump in my stock price, but if I have to put it back down, it'll cost me 2%. So that's the asymmetric response. It's a differential response. As a result, they end up raising dividends in this sort of fashion. And what we can do, though, is we can estimate a line that goes through here, and we can use that estimated growth rate of the line to come up with our G. Is it going to be perfect? No. Is beta perfect? No. Remember the pictures with the shotgun blast? Beta is not perfect either. And so neither one of these things are going to be perfect. Now, what if I give you enough information to calculate uh, the cost of equity using both the security market line and the dividend discount model? What should you do? Mr. Salas Hernandez, I saw a brief glimmer. Yeah. Uh, it's gone, okay. Um, James Sunday. I've got two, what do I do? I can, I can, what's that? Using the historical. How about this? So I've got two things here that are, that I know are both flawed, right? They're both just estimates. Yeah. Average them, right? Average them. I knew you knew. You just average them. That's it, right? And you're like, I hope he doesn't do that to me on an exam, <laughs> right? I don't think I will. I don't think I will. But if I did, now you know what to do. Okay, next time we are going to talk about how we're going to get our cost of debt. Are there any questions?